Hey everybody, Divertimento episode 10. Today I have the great pianist David Berkman as my guest. Thank you. Um, how are you doing? I'm good, how about you? I'm good, we both got masks on. We're actually in Tokyo. Usually I, I video this uh, in New York City, in Queens. And uh, since you're here in Tokyo, and I'm here in Tokyo, yeah. we figured it's a good chance to do it. Um, right. As they say, itari kitari. Itari kitari. Very good. We go and come. <laughs> <laughs> You've learned your yeah, I have a, uh, uh, Japanese words that are so commonly known by foreigners. Itari kitari. Actually, I studied Japanese for a while, but oh, you did. I'm still not great. But, okay, uh, okay. But don't, don't, don't put me to the test. But, <laughs> but I, I've, been studying, I've been studying Japanese pretty Diligently for the well, last three, four years. And you had a good, you had a good jump on it. Uh, four years ago, I was like speaking. You know, katakoto is. Uh, katakoto. Very like, here, there, here, there, like. All right. Like, like chopped up. That's how I. Speak. Sort of like you, yeah, sort or, of like, or me. like Jean Jackson. Okay. Well, I'm not. Yeah, I don't. I don't, but, I don't know. But I said which, which like because I'm visually. At. People, I mean, I'm Japanese, right. so I better be learn. I better learn to speak. I, well, I don't get, I, I don't get the pass. Right, right, right. So I've been, I've been kind of studying diligently, but um, that's great. So I want to get back to it. yeah, we, we got both got masks on, masks on because Japan, uh, Tokyo again is going through another seventh wave. Yeah, and it's very discouraging because when is this gonna end? For the last three years. I've been sort of been you know flung around by sure. COVID. All, uh, yeah. all musicians probably, if not yeah. just everybody, you know. Um, yeah, I guess everybody figures it out for themselves. You know, when I was I came here at the I've been here for the last two months, and I was trying to get here for the for years right, before, for right. a couple of years before that because um, my guys. wife was here, so yeah. we were kind of separated by the by the by COVID. Right. But um, you know, I think. Uh, you you just figure out what at a certain point I mean because it does seem like most of the cases are milder now and all that kind of stuff you just decide what you're gonna do and for me I just decided when I'm inside with people I wear a mask but I I'm not as opposed to when this all began I'm like going out to clubs playing gigs not worrying right, about any of that right. stuff so well, even or writing the Yamanote line the, you know? even writing <laughs> exactly the Yamanote line which is very crowded right. yeah. Um entry so at the entry bands i think that some are still there like my son wanted to come for august but they still not they're still not allowing tours soon oh really okay um yeah unless you sign up to some sort of like what do you call like a group tour oh, okay via a tourist company but then you can't go anywhere you have right. to follow you have to follow the exact agenda that the tourist company right. gives you right and even that now requires a visa so mm. you have to apply for that, and yeah. it takes time, and oh my goodness. Yeah, it's a, um, yeah, who knows when this will all be over, but we have to wow. keep moving forward and doing the best we can under, under the circumstances. Right, because for the last three years, tours are, you know, postponed, right. my recording got postponed, everything. Yeah. You, by the way, you teach at a university. Right. Where in uh, New York do you teach? I teach at Queens. Queens, Queens College. College. Yeah, as, as part as of like a jazz CUNY. professor or yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's part of the... City University of New York system. Great. So. And how, yeah. did you guys go to online uh, We did online or? for a couple of semesters, and then like the one semester when it hit, and then the next one also we were mostly online. Then this last one, we were in person with little remnants of online. Oh, Actually, for the last two semesters, it's been like that. So I think the way it looks now is when we start again in the fall, it'll be fully in this person. This fall? Oh, it was yeah. a couple months from now. Yeah. Uh, one, yeah. One September. We yeah, we started at the end of August. Oh, you do a little early for yep. university. Yep. That's I mean. It's... But it was a nice job to have when when all the gigs went away. It That's, was really it was great to be a professor. I mean, I like teaching anyway, and I yeah, like okay. I like that program. But it was a time when I I never appreciated the gig more right, than, right. <laughs> than when all the gigs disappeared. That was like the day the gigs the gigs ended. Yeah, it was like a, a, a steady paycheck day. via exactly. university. Yeah, it just comes company. into your straight to your bank account. That's, and that's very like, helpful. Yeah. Um, so. Man, so that's I mean you know I had a student that from Shanghai mm. and she I kind of helped her get into Senzuk College here. Oh, you know, okay, you know nice. yeah, sure. in Saitama. And she hasn't been, I mean, she's just already finished 
her second year mm. all online yeah. from Shanghai. Yeah, I really ha- feel bad for her yeah. because she said like the tuition is still exactly the same. If yeah, pretty right. much. If, if not the same, maybe I don't know. But it's just, ours was exactly the same. No it's change. It's sad, man, because she she loves Japan, but yeah. she she hasn't. So she's still in Shanghai. She took right. a year off now because it's kind of ridiculous. Right. Trying to well, do I mean, learning. Yeah, we had that where the when you finally when we finally met in person, uh, I guess which was last fall, there were people that I had had in the program already for two semesters I think there was somebody for three semesters that I had never met and actually until this last spring there were people whose bottom half of the face I'd never seen I, I well I'd seen some of them online but I had a few that I that I saw only in classes and I didn't have the first year that we were online and so I'd actually never seen the bottom half of their face and it was oh like my the, the whole thing was you know but I think for us it was more what well, the way we looked at it was or the way I tried to look at it was it's not that this is as good as in-person education, but what are you going to do? I mean, like for a lot of these students, it was better to have something. That right. weekly meeting, that the, the meetings that they had online were really right. much better than having nothing. What about like uh, international students? Do you yeah. have the uh, uh, international student a crowd in uh, yeah. Queens College? A lot, yeah. So what about the time difference? How do you deal with that? Yeah. Like if, I mean, if she, like, I have friends here in Japan that got accepted to Berkeley. Right. And they could, and they said, like, well, the classes are, like, four in the morning. Right. Or something. Is that really true? What, well, what I did, I mean, because, first of all, we're only a master's program. Oh, so we don't have quite the same profile. Yeah, because we don't have the whole undergrad thing. Yeah. But what I did with my classes was I had, uh, we taped the class so that they could, watch it at, at, oh, their, own at their own time and then I met with an I met an extra hour because the only the only students that we had that were international were Asian students right so everybody was on the same time so, so. everybody was from Asia not no not in Europe that's, yeah, that's we didn't have a, yeah. That's, that's I think the Europeans could make the time because it wasn't that huge yeah, six, it six, wasn't six, as bad six, seven hours. yeah it wasn't like four in the morning but, yeah. but I had students that would have to get up at three yeah, in yeah. China and so Oof. I yeah, so the way I did it is I just taught an extra hour and I met with them. I they watched the thing, they watched the the class, the regular right. class, and then they met with me for an hour those four or five students. So no, man, just, you know, in Berkeley College music the tuition is that. not a yes. joke anymore. No. That's like, you know, That's a very more the school. tuition is more expensive than mo- the average person's salary in the United States. Definitely. Wow. That's why they should all go to Queens. <laughs> all go to Queens yeah. College. Well, it is Mr. I mean, David Berkman. Yeah, it's a government school. It's a state school. It's it's by jazz standards. It's really cheap. But yeah, anyway. but I mean, it's also a good, great teacher. Yeah, there great, you go. Thank uh, you very much. Staff. Yeah. Um, yeah, Antonio. Some few, yeah, some of my friends gone That's there. Uh, Bogna, right? The, the yeah, Bogna yeah, Bogna. Goes. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Few well, other, and Sebastian. Sebastian Manwe. Yeah, he was my student. Oh really? I oh, I gave I think I gave you his number the first time. I, that that I don't remember, but uh, yeah, oh, it's amazing. And uh, yeah, I was always recommending him. So. And who's the other? Uh, somebody just told me recently that I went to uh, Queens College, therefore they knew you. Mm. Oh, uh, Grant Stewart. Oh yeah. Is this, I didn't, he moved away, right? Right, but I didn't really. Oh, no, know no, 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 Grant. Him. I didn't know him at Queens. I knew him from here. No, the pianist Grant. The Japanese uh, American I know, guy, not Grant Stewart. Grant, what was his, his last name? Richards. Yeah, Grant Richards. But he didn't go to Queens. Oh, I thought he because he told me. So I, I had some done some playing with him here, and then he said I'm going to move to New York and yeah. go to Queens College. I think he, we talked about it, and I think in the end he didn't. Oh, but, I see, I see. But great piano player. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's you know, it's all part of the community. What one of the things that I like about teaching there is, is that you know, being in New York, you're always getting this constant flood of people from around the United States and from around the world. But it's just, for me, I don't look at it as like, you know, teaching can seem like a like sort of a top-down thing, but for me, it's just like expanding the jazz community. Yeah, you know? I think so, so. I've had so many great students who do all kinds of different things, like Sebastian. And yeah, like yeah. Many, many, many Even others. Tana. Tana, yeah. she said like she studied from your book. Oh, really? <laughs> not, not take classes with you, but okay. there was some book that you had. Yeah, like, I wrote a book for singers. Uh, oh, you did? So th- that, that she t- had told Among me that others. like, yeah, she had used that. Nice. So that's, that's well, great, she, man. Well, I'll definitely start 
uh, using her as a as a uh, recommendation for the book. I mean, she's, a, she's a pretty great advertisement for uh, an improvisational singer. Uh, so yeah, she's she's really she's one of a kind. awesome, awesome, yeah. awesome. Uh, I mean, the, actually, the only singer I know that actually could solo over my songs at a really, really high level. So that's that's this beautiful yeah, thing that she's, she's great. doing. Let's see, and so. COVID happened. How how did you keep your uh, motivation up? Like for myself, I got kind of into bad habits because yeah. I was home a lot in New York. Heroin. New York, yeah, heroin. <laughs> New York locked down really quickly, right? right? I mean, like some uh, like that Trump. Were you guy, there in the beginning? Part? Yes, I yeah. was. Like Trump had said something like in February, and then like boom, t- and he said it was a cold. Right. He right, said right. it was nothing. Yeah. Don't worry, it's just a cold. And in two, two weeks, weeks later, it'll all be over. Yeah. He's yeah, like, two yeah. weeks later, New York City was in right. lockdown. Right. Well, in New York, I think. You know, a lot of people experienced a lot of things, and everybody had it different. You know, I know people who lost, like, family members, and, you know, so everybody experienced this thing in different ways. And, you know, tragedy is visited on different people at different times. But, um, you know, so in that sense, I think I got off pretty light. But I do think that people who were in New York in the beginning, when when the the virus was really at its most lethal and nobody also nobody really knew, knew what, the what was going on yeah. no vaccine or nothing i mean there was a period where i was inside in the house pretty much you know 24 7 yeah, for about too. three months you yeah. know because i the thing is when you go outside in new york there's people everywhere you know i live in washington heights and it's like you walk outside your door and there's people yeah. on the street and at that time we didn't know how bad it was, you know? So um, I was just, you know, it was very isolating. And one thing that I think is musicians have an advantage in that we, you know, if we have a lot of time to shed, you know, to practice, that's not, that's a good thing for us, right? So, and I think piano players also, because I'm really interested in solo piano. And solo piano is a way to perform music by yourself, yeah. right? So yeah. in that sense, I felt like there were musical goals that I had that I could keep up with. That's, but, that's good. But it was, you know, the the challenge was like figuring out how to, you know, I, I was fairly motivated musically, at least to practice. I didn't write as much as I thought I would, right. but, but um, you know, the, eventually it's just your mood that you're, you know, you're right. I mean, for, for myself, yeah, the time depressing. was great, but all, at the same time, my whole family was in the house, right? My son's right. school. That's a different so thing. that's a, you know, yeah. Uh, it's a lot of my friends, they ended up getting like a COVID divorce. Uh, yeah, really? Because now they're, you know, they're, they never right, spend so much time with 24 the... seven together. Right. And you know how small the apartments in New York yeah. can be. And Tokyo. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah. And Tokyo. And, right. and now it's like, Every, you know the, the the jobs are no longer commuting so yeah. you, the wife or whoever's doing the day job were not at home too and it caused a lot of tension yeah and even I, in japan i read the news that uh there are a lot of uh problems with that you know sure. husband staying home 24 7 yeah period no that makes sense I, for me because shoko was here yeah. and we kind of couldn't figure out a way yeah, to get yeah, in touch yeah. you know to to be in the same country so you had, it was you just had your house isolated. for yourself and yeah. you were able to i mean it wasn't practice. we didn't have that COVID divorce problem other than just being apart for a year. Well, yeah, so, not every, yeah, some people but, even get closer during right. a time like that, but it, right. I guess that's just, you know, that's just, uh, I mean, the other individual thing, Yeah, <laughs> and I think the other thing for us that was nice was, it's, we'd had that experience of doing this back and forth thing, so it wasn't like the first time we were sort of apart, so that right. helped, but yeah, it was very difficult, and I think the thing that was so challenging is you're in a situation where, I mean, I would not being in the same situation you were in, but in a, like a very isolated kind of thing, you end up kind of thinking, the only thing that's keeping me from like not, you know, whatever, writing a piano concerto tomorrow is my own mental, you know, that's state, true. you know, and it's, but that's not, that makes it sound like you're sort of beating yourself up for not doing more. It's kind of like, that's a real thing. You know, we were in a pandemic and it was depressing and scary well, and confusing, been, yeah. you know. And so I think people had to, you had, for me, I had to kind of come to terms with how much can I actually do? What can I get done? Things like, one thing that was really helpful was I did a number of live streaming things, you know, just solo concerts from my house. There was a guy in um, uh, Spain who was who puts these things on and so I would do those and you know when I was able to I would go to uh there's a gallery in Brooklyn soapbox gallery you played there I think right soapbox soapbox gallery it's a gallery in Brooklyn 
Is this a new? No, I don't think so. What, okay. it's, it's called Soapbox? Soapbox oh, Gallery. No. Oh, check it out. Um, but it's a, you know, they were doing a live streaming thing, and it's, a, you know, it's it's another one of these right. alternative venues that opened. Yeah. So I started doing these solo events, and that helped me have something to focus for. Another thing that I did that really helped me a lot, one of my closest friends is a great piano player named Bruce Barth. Oh, yes. And we would do, um, we would just get on Zoom and play tunes together. Not really together, more no, like... because you have like a lag. Right. right? You're, You're not, we weren't time. playing with each other, but we would play, He, you know, he would, basically, he's playing a solo piano right, thing. Right. We are trading, essentially. Right. You know, there's an a app yeah. by Yamaha, I think, right. that, that fixes it. I, but I have never tried it, and I, I don't know exactly how, you know good it really works but i know that musicians around the world tried that thing where yeah. they try to play together yeah. via the internet and some people have yeah i and actually dennis mccrell at our school he was really into that so we were always trying it and it was like, it's hard I it's, mean, yeah, yeah. first of all there's always there tends to be a, a little lag and yeah. also the other problem is usually you're balancing time lag versus quality of sound yes so you could get the thing to sound absolutely horrible and you'd be playing yeah, at the yeah, same yeah, time yeah, yeah, yeah. but it would be sort of so brutal it's still, you know? yeah it still have a it still has a, to play simultaneously together i've seen some amazing videos by some yeah. japanese artists where it's not they're not playing simultaneously together yeah they but they layered it yeah and I'm like, wow, man. and the video editing and all those things. Oh, yeah. Some people get great at it. Yeah, some people really rose and to I'm the, like, <laughs> the technology. Yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a video idiot. I don't right, have no too. clue how to like do, what is it, the, uh, uh, what is it, Apple Final Pro, whatever those like. I think the, Final Cut. Is Final the, Cut. Yeah. I, 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 so, that, you know, the whole concept of this video, I use I iPhone, but it's, yeah. it's recorded at 4K though. Oh, okay. And wow. it's a casual conversation with yeah. all these great musicians and artists and people that I've worked with. Not just limited to uh, musicians, but like sound engineers nice. and, and, and uh, oh, lyricists and mm. things like that. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, we, so we went through the COVID thing. Um, well, let me ask you this Why New York? Are you from New York originally? No, I'm no, from you're not. Cleveland, Ohio. You're from Cleveland, the middle America. Yeah. Wow. Well, Trump, Trump country. Well, uh, <laughs> not you, you know I hope. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Cleveland actually, so Cleveland is like, actually what's funny about all these like, you know, sort of uh, middle America stuff, it's not, even in like Tennessee, right. Nashville is not Republican. Oh, really? Not really. You know, okay, it's like okay. the suburbs might be, but in all, almost everywhere, the cities are the more cultural you know. yeah cultures. so like the, the university towns Cleveland's Cleveland kind of a hospital town and here's a university town now. anyway so you know, I come from a very uh, lefty background my father was a labor lawyer I mean it's like you know so uh, that's and there was you know that was a real uh, there was a lot of that and it, I would say Cleveland is pretty different politically than Ohio as a whole oh I see so just to get that out there not, okay, not that it really matters but yeah. yeah that is where I'm from Cleveland and, and then I'm, you moved to New York quite a long a time long, ago a long time ago yeah somewhere during the the, the uh, Jurassic period Jurassic I period no I moved so, to Cle actually what happened was I went to I was going to do something else I think I was when I went to college I wanted to be a novelist actually oh uh, and and I wrote another some, high paying job. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I wrote some really bad fiction for a while, and then I. Uh, but I'd always played, and so I took a couple semesters at Berkeley, and I ended up thinking, okay, I can. Oh, you I, didn't go to Berkeley for Boston. for a, a summer session and one fall session. Oh. This and then I transferred those credits to. I was I was in school in Ann Arbor actually at the University of Michigan. Oh, I see. Which had didn't really have a jazz program at the time. So, anyway. When I, I decided, okay, I'm just going to go out and go back. To, and I went back to Cleveland and I played, which was actually nice. So I played for about three years just in house bands around town. Right. And there were a lot of great players from there. Was Levano, Joe Levano was from there. Yeah. And uh, Greg Bandy, great drummer. Jamie yeah. Haddad, a percussionist and drummer. Anyway, there were a lot of, you know, sort of fine musicians. And also, I could play in house bands and they would bring people in sometimes. So I played for Four Nights with Sonny Stitt. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, a lot of like great formative. Like, Jurassic Sonny yeah. Stitt. What was that? Sonny Stitt getting, passed away years ago. Getting killed by, you know. Well, Sonny oh. Stitt, man. What a badass. Oh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Whenever you get to play with any one of those guys, like it's all, for me, it was always really, even people you hadn't thought that much about. Like I remember doing, a, I mean, obviously, incredible, credible player, but I had, you know, um, 
Well, first, let's go back to Sonny Stitt. So I played Four Nights with him, and it was really because there were some better piano players than me. I was 20. I was still mm-hmm. reading tunes out of a real book and just trying to keep up. But, um, you know, those three guys were busy, or they, they were right. out of, somebody was out of town or something. So that was a great situation because you could play with people uh, doing that. Oh, wow. It was nice to just play around town and sort of not have the... I think in New York, it's always more of a kind of... A, you have to be out hustling a little bit more. Like mm. in, in being from a small jazz scene, it was really just nice to go and play and play with all different kinds of people. I was sort of trying to play, I was kind of playing out of, the, <clears throat> out of a Bud Powell kind of book. But I do funk gigs, you do everything because there weren't that many players, you know, and so once you get on the list, you get called all the time. So, so what made you eventually move to New York City? I'd always planned on coming Come to New, New York. York. Like, I, like I many, a, many jazz musicians, aspiring jazz musicians, yeah. want to try out their metal, to test themselves well, I always, in the New York i would never taken a vacation anywhere else. Like, you know, when by the time I got out of college, I, we would, you know, we'd play a bunch of gigs, we'd save some money, we'd come to New York with 300 bucks or 400 bucks, we'd sleep on somebody's floor and go to two gigs a night, you know, and go hear everybody as much as we could. Right. And then four or five nights later, we'd drive back to Cleveland, you know, right. so it was like, New York was the only place I ever right. went. How do you I, feel about New York now? Uh, I was talking, I think with Tana about this. Mm. The scene has changed so much. Yeah. And then with COVID, yeah, it's, it's even like many of the great musicians have moved out of New York some City. Some have died. Some Sadly, passed away, yeah. right? But but the you know ones that are still like yeah. our age, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, said forget it. It's just I'm so tired of the hustle. Yeah, and people that I never barely survivable income. Right. I mean, it's playing. I mean, the, you know, I moved to New York in 1991, and I think I got more money playing gigs back then, and mm-hmm. then 2020. Right as and and it it's really hasn't changed at all, and yeah. yet my rent has right tripled whatever right. you know over right. the years. So, how do people do it? Yeah, it's that's a great question, and you know I, I think, you know part of the thing is you get older, you know, so yeah. your situation kind of develops, you know, because a lot of times someone will say, "Wow, how do your students?" Get? And I'm like, I have no idea. Right. I just don't. I mean, know, well, you know? yeah, because you know, like a students are like they're. When I moved to New York, I split an apartment with a friend of mine from Cleveland, a guitar player who moved from Cleveland, and uh, our rent was four hundred fifty bucks for the whole thing. So it was like two and a quarter right. each. You know, my, was my, like, when, when I first moved, it was a six hundred dollar apartment, in Williamsburg, three hundred each. Right, same thing. <laughs> so it was like in that kind of environment, you could kind of manage, right? You get a well, few I, I got gigs. a job. <laughs> you, oh, you got <laughs> a job. job. <laughs> Yeah, when I first moved, I had a job, but then I did wedding. I did everything. You know, I did weddings. I I taught at a horrible, awful teaching gig, and you know, whatever. I just mm-hmm. did whatever I could, and then I went on the road a couple with a big band. You know, you just did various things. But the point is, the rent wasn't so crazy. Yeah. You know, that I had it students still... that were paying like, I don't know, like twelve hundred bucks. Like as soon as they like with the first, a roommate. Yeah, with with a roommate with yeah. two roommates. Two you roommates. know, so. I don't entirely know the answer to that, but I know, um, you know, I think people find their path, you know, obviously some people do do other things. Right, and, well, the, the, the fact is, yeah, we may be older, but the only people we see in New York are the ones who are still doing it. Right, well, So right. it's their parents, or maybe they're independently wealthy. Rashid Ali told me years ago, a very good company. Mean, probably wealthy people, but maybe. He, I mean, maybe he, I just he don't said know. Like, he, he's like, look. This is New York City, and whether you you know you you figure you say, well, how are they doing it? Well, they're doing it. So whether they're getting money from gigs or parents or you know or maybe a, they they got like a gigantic uh, will that you know somebody. I think a lot of times they're they have it. They're two income families. Yeah, too. Well, you yeah, know, like whatever. people that are married and you there's know, the... a very common uh, wife works uh, and the husband is the musician. Right. Uh, vice versa. Part of the worst, yeah. Um, sometimes they're both musicians. You know, I know several. Uh, most of them don't last, but some of them do sure. last. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I found over the years that the ones that don't last are the ones where one becomes <clears throat> really famous and other one doesn't. In um, New York. <clears throat> you paid your dues. I think so. Over the years. Yeah. Um, would you still recommend New York City to... Young well, you, musicians. You sort of you asked like really about the scene and how it's changed. And yeah. I'm always trying to figure out like 
I know it's changed because my relationship to it has changed. I mean, first of all, I know it's changed, period. It, 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 there's, you can't, you, you know, it's, it's different. For me, really one of the big, I mean, I've been there since 1985. And one of the big changes was after 9-11. That yeah. was like, because I felt like, I remember like maybe a year or two, so this is like 2002, 2003, I was in the village and it was, I was in, the, uh, in Sheridan Square and I look over, and for some reason, 55 Bar wasn't doing anything. 55 Bar doesn't exist anymore. But anyway, 55 right. Bar wasn't doing anything. Uh, it was uh, Sweet, at that point it was called Sweet, sweet Basil Rhythm. Oh, Sweet Rhythm. It was Sweet Basils. It was Sweet Rhythm at that point. They were closed. And I was just looking around. Nobody was there. And I was like, it was like 1230. And I was like, I can't picture this corner being this dead. Right. And, you know, and so somewhat... It came back, but you know, for me, when I first moved, got to New York, I think I heard <clears throat> Kenny Barron ten times in the first month. Mm. You know, people just there. The playing scene was different because there was Bradleys, there was, you know, uh, the Vanguard. I used to at the Vanguard when I first moved to New York. Vanguard was six fifty to get in. Six fifty, and you got a drink. Wow, a, tic- a little ticket for a drink. So no, it's like not anymore. Yeah, you know, it's like it was a different vibe in the sense that you could go out and hear a lot of music, and a lot of places didn't really cost all that much. Right. So, what I noticed was the first thing that really st- seemed to change was that a lot of like the sort of mainstream jazz clubs, like places that would have Kenny Barron and people like that, and Mulgrew Miller, those kind of players, um, were those places got it really expensive. And they also stopped playing, like Kenny Barron used to play two um, weeks a month at, at uh, Bradley's practically. So, you know, for a young piano player, just moved to town, you know, you could walk into Bradley's, play, you know, have a beer and like sit there for three hours, right. you know, and just hear more Kenny Barron than you'd ever heard in your life, you know. And uh, so that was such a great thing that kind of changed. The way I, I think about it now, it seems like, there's always going to be this big, or uh, there still is a big pull for young musicians to come to come New York. Come to New York. Yeah, there's so many great young players that you hear, you yeah, know, yeah. like some of the ones you mentioned. I mean, they're yeah. younger than me anyway. Yeah. Sebastian and Kana are not that that young anymore, but they're still, you know, I remember when they came to town and, the, the, you know, there's always a, a stream, you right, know, like coming right. to Juilliard and coming to... Manhattan yeah, School of Music, music and, you know, yeah. all those places, and they play at jam sessions at Smalls. And so there's this scene, this intense group of young, very talented people coming to New York. Um, what there isn't quite as much is this kind of sense that you could hear anybody. Like, I heard Herbie Hancock in clubs, you know? So it's like, I don't feel like, I feel like the the scene has gotten sort of attenuated or, like, stretched out a little bit. So, like, you're not going to see you know, Pat Metheny or Herbie Hancock in a jazz club in New York, for the right, most part. Right, right. Herbie Hancock used to play the Vanguard, and then he, after that he played... At the Vanguard, Yeah, wow. then he played Blue the Blue Note. And then, and now I don't think... I mean, Chick played the Blue Note for his 75th birthday. Yeah, yeah, and like so, a special kind yeah. of... Yeah, <clears throat> but I think mostly you're not going to hear those people. And uh, and it, the Blue Note is going to cost you, I don't know, $75 or something, or 100 I have no idea. To be honest uh, with you, I don't know how much it We're going cost. years back. Yeah. But when Keith Jarrett there, when I played there, the ticket was 100 bucks. 100 so bucks. by the time you walked out, it was yeah. 200 bucks each, you know, because you had to, to pay. That's buy a some lot drinks. of money to throw down. <laughs> yeah, for, 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 you know, for a musician. Right. I, I, I couldn't. And if you go hear Keith Jarrett, you might get yelled at. Well, if you're making making noise, <laughs> if you're like coughing yeah. or something like yeah. I just if did. somebody coughs, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. all oh, right, you well, you have been tossed out of that club. Yeah, blue no, note. That's... Um, well, but that was an amazing performance. I yeah, still remember sure. 1995. It I remember that. Oh, really? Yeah, it has I remember a whole those album. too. Like you know, some of the times I heard. Herbie, but those were like life-changing experiences, you know? Yeah, Herbie, too. Uh, I remember the first time I heard him at the Blue Note, and he was playing with Al Foster and Buster Williams. Oh, trio. Yeah, and he played just one of those things. And it was like, that was the first time I understood that you could reharmonize in the moment. Like, you could just be playing, and you're, you're off the chord changes, and then magically you're back on the chord changes. And I was like... How does he do that? And yeah, I was like, yeah. but it was, but I knew the tune, like I knew the standard, and so I was like, wait, he's going, but a bit of a bit of, he's going up in half steps. The song doesn't go up in half steps there, you know. It was like it was right, like he's, light he's, bulb, light bulb, you know. He's doing something else, you know. So, 
But I think, you know, that in experience of being sort of close to a lot of the music, you know, I'm always telling students it sounds like an a old guy thing to say, but go hear George Coleman, you know, like he's 87. It's really important. Barry Harris I used to hear a lot, you know, it's like those he are... passed away now. Yeah, from COVID. Oh, was so, it from COVID? COVID yeah. Oh, no. Yeah, we love him and Lee Konitz. That yeah. was two really big ones. But anyway, you know, so I think... I think the scene is, it was, you know, I think I would hear from older guys what it was like in like the 50s or something, you know, and, and, and I think the thing they always talked about was that it was more compact, you know, you mm -hmm. could go hear Ben Webster and Charlie Parker on 52nd Street, they were both playing there, and so their bands, people were hanging out, they'd go hear one, they, you know, and the players would, you know, on a break, they would go check out somebody down the street, it was really tight, and I, I feel like that's the process that's been happening in New York. It's becoming more and more, you know, sort of diffuse. And so I think, you know, there's still great players, there's amazing musicians, but I feel like with the younger players, they listen more to each other than they do to... The older generation. Yeah. So I feel like there's a little less huh. of a sense of everybody on the same team a little bit. But that also is can be a function of me just getting older and, you know, being yeah, separated I mean, from it. <clears throat> you know, just recently, uh, my son has a classmate who's an aspiring musician, and uh -huh. he came over to my house in uh, Queens, and he saw a piano, mm. and he said to me, people still really play this thing? Oh, God. <laughs> he's like, so what depressing. And he's like, what for? It's like everything's now available on the computer and I can write and program things on this computer that no humans could ever play. And well, that's what it sounds like Frank Zappa's rap. That's and, what and it's like, you know, and it takes years and years and years of solitary work on this thing, you know. Me mechanical instrument, he says, we're not, and he's a very, very smart guy. Uh, he sounds he's like, like a, right up there, you know, in the 97 really, person He sounds very smart. He creates really pretty amazing computer music yeah and uh and he says like you know for me he's like you know and he, you know i get along with him man but he's like for me i can't imagine spending 10 hours a day in front of this clunky thing yeah when i can just do this and and he said i have more chance of making a living with this than that you know so he was just kind of smart going, kid and i didn't really know how to answer that because i also play a mechanical instrument yeah. a string on a piece of wood Right, right, and my muscles are, as you grow older atrophy. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't play. I mean, you know, I used to be able to play things in my twenties and thirties, but now I can't really do this so well on the uh, because I'm older. And yeah, it's a. I mean, it's a good point. It, yeah. I think it depends how you view yourself. I think one. You know, did you ever see that movie Jiro Dreams of Sushi? Yes, I did. So this movie, you know, yeah, which, he's which, like ninety. <laughs> yeah, and he's making sushi, and he's making sushi, but there's a thing he's doing that is kind of very special about his approach to i mean it's really i mean obviously this is something that really ties into japanese culture a lot right because this sense of being an artisan or right. like making artisan like, yeah yeah making like the perfect pot yeah. or like making you know the perfect like, ramen yeah perfect ra right like these guys was, get yeah. serious about this yeah stuff. making a super ramen or like or even like you know the perfect like uh you know flower arranging all these different kind of things that are about not like necessarily a new idea but like an appreciation of something that's just is in the moment right. like that's the difference i think people who think about music like that it's all ideas and information and i can do this and i can do that and it's something that no human could ever play true you know that is definitely true but you're not necessarily making something in that traditional sense of being an artisan like you said right like, you know, to be and also i, I don't think that jazz can ever be played that way because it's like you're improvising in real time to what your other fellow musicians are doing right no matter how advanced ai gets on the computer mm -hmm. i don't think there it's still not at that level where it can kind of listen to what's going around them and then spit out yeah i mean i think the thing that's appealing about jazz you know is something about the moment and yeah, something about expression the, is free yeah man. humanity and the right. you know like if you you know, if you hear whoever, somebody who's playing you love, you know, it has that, it sort of smells of their personality in a certain right. way, you know, right. and it's like, it's, yes, you could have a computer program it to do almost the exact same thing, 
but is it really going to have that feeling of you know right. whatever Lee Konitz or for, for example right. it's, it's not the information it's kind of the way it happens in the moment yes. and I think you know that's a I mean the student you're talking about the, the kid you're, you're talking about he sounds like a smart oh, kid he's awfully smart but that also is a very young kind of thing to say. Yeah, you know, of course because it it's is. like it it's 17, 18 years old. Yeah, it yeah, feels like something a, a smart 18 and year old. Saw, would you say. Know, and like 17, 18, like my son, they're, they're always looking at older people from like, like from upwards, you know, right, like right, all right. you old fogies. This yeah, is like yeah. my grandfather listens to. You right, know? right, right. So I'm going to create new stuff, you yeah, know, yeah. Just new sounds, yep. new thing. Right. And good for him. And I hope, you know, whatever he's. Gonna, if he's gonna pursue music like he said he is, he finds mm. something through his own creativity and technological. Man, these kids are so great at technology. Yeah. It's just incredible that does. Because it's their native language. Yeah, it's like a native it's, language. The, he native makes speakers. his own plugins and he makes yeah. his own sounds. And, yeah. What is that? Ableton Live and all those kind of things that yeah. he does. That it's That's just cool. phenomenal, you know. But but I mean, I kind of you know. Uh, heard what he was saying yeah like, as time has changed right yeah. and and i mean those are valid points and, you know, and, just, you and, to... and he's like would would you like if it was your grandson or your son would just recommend trying to become a jazz performer to make a living and survive in this world i don't know about that well my i'm glad my son chose something else but right. but I mean, I mean my parents my father was an amateur piano player right and he, he was a lawyer or, uh, as I said before, and he, um, but they, he discouraged me. I mean, oh, he was he, like, he, yeah, yeah, he was trying to get me not to do that. Because, um, yeah, he thought it was a bad way to make a living. You know, he thought it was a, a hard life that you wouldn't have the same kind of right. stability. And I saw know. a Sonny Rollins interview that talked exactly about, he said, listen, it's, it's not for the music to decide whether you make a living right. or not. And it's like, if you're going to worry about that, if it's, if that's something that you have to think about. Right. You know, then he said, don't do it. Just listen. Well, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I, 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 there was a period where I used to hear, um, when, right when sort of Facebook and SNS, social media, all that stuff started, I would sometimes see these posts from people who were dissing jazz schools. They say, yeah, they're just taking people's money and students don't realize that there's no life for them <laughs> outside of all this. And I was like, <laughs> man, if you're a kid going to college and you think you're gonna you're gonna study jazz because that's gonna make you a jazz star. You deserve whatever whatever you get. You know, it's like you have to go into these things with your eyes open. I mean, I, I have to say, even though at the time when my father was a little bit discouraging about, you know, was trying to get me to really think about if I wanted to do this, I still I'm not sorry that there was a little bit of resistance because that just showed me that I wanted to do it anyway. Right. You know, so that's like, yeah. I mean, you 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 end up doing it because yeah. you have to do it in yeah. a way. And, yeah. And those are the people that I think I enjoy hanging out the most, yeah. talking with the most. And you know, maybe mostly money like, isn't maybe the most important thing in your like life. You know, you just it's, it's, it may not be the most important thing. That's so I'd say <laughs> it, it, it's true. That's very true. I, I who said that? The wise guy said uh, money isn't gonna. Uh, bring happiness to you but without money you yeah. won't be happy well there's something to that there's something to that i mean because yeah you do have to you know and also like a lot of times when i say something like that it's a well you know it's a gene uh you know it's always so every time i hear like musicians say oh it's not about the money they usually already have a house they have a you know they have a living going on you know they're not they, they may not be like multi-millionaires but they're right. you know comfortable it seems like so it's like it's like it's well, kind of hard I've, to take that medicine yeah. from somebody who isn't on the street true homeless but i also yes that's true but i also look i mean everybody has the the cards they're dealt right yeah. you know i mean i came from like I didn't come from abject poverty, yeah, you know, yeah. I had a, my dad, like I said, my dad was a lawyer, oh, he made yeah. a pretty good living, you know, and, um, but, uh, you know, you decide, like, whether, you know, how, when I moved to, I mean, I lived like a pretty poor student for a lot of years, yeah, me too. you know, <laughs> right. so, you know, it's like, uh, I, like I said, I mean, I, I teach at Queens College, and that gave me more financial right. security great, than I ever great. expected, but, yeah. Um, but at any rate, I mean, for a long time, I was just trying to figure out how to do it, how to go about it. I mean, I wrote books, I did, you know, I did a lot of different things. And in some ways, 
You know, it's funny because the, uh, I remember talking about this with Tom Rainey, the drummer. Yeah, great, he's a uh, great drummer. Yeah, and he was saying, we were, to, we were on the road together with, with a band a long time ago, and we were in Europe, and we were talking about, is it better that, like, the U.S. should support the arts more? That was kind of the discussion. Oh, I see, I see. And he was like, yes and no, because mm-hmm. he said, in my opinion, a lot of the strongest musicians he's ever met and creative musicians live in New York. And there's a lot of these places where, you know, we were in uh, Holland, and there was a lot of support there, you know? Like, so some people like, uh, you know, Han Benek or something, these people are like national treasures, and they're basically supported. And he's like, you know, there's something good about having the pressure of having to, you know, deliver the goods, you know, and having Mm. to do a lot of different things. And he he wasn't sure that he wanted to trade, you know, for the Mm. kind of European model. He's like... You know, jazz came out of the streets, <laughs> and you know, and sometimes the toughness of having to deliver is a is a good thing. So I don't know. I don't. I don't. I'm I'm sort of agnostic. I don't know exactly how I feel about it. I think there should be more support than there is. Well, I think there's. Sh- I mean, it's, I mean, the audience as well is so yeah. few. Right. And it, I mean, it's such a great. That's probably the only um, true American art form, and there's more support for it here in japan or right. europe yeah on the regular public level well that's true then you i mean you know it's you know it's pretty difficult to fill a place in new york city you yeah. know and um, there's a million, million and, musicians and so there's great, a lot of competition for yeah with too. great musicians yeah um so it's so uh, that is one of the really nice things about being here, I have to say. Cause well, I, yeah, there's so many venues. A lot of venues. Oh, my goodness. And there's a lot of great players. Here. Yeah, there's and I, I feel one of the positive things I feel here is that I'm not flung around by uh, venues. Like, yeah. they don't want me to play that, I don't care. I mean, there's another venue that wants me to play. Yeah. In New York, everybody's fighting for that little crumb. Yeah, and those sure. those places close. 55 close, what, the uh, the Jazz Standard close, right? I, have, I had a friend who was, <laughs> he was trying to get a gig at the 55 bar. And he, the, the, I don't know if you ever, I never really worked there that much, but, um, I, you know, over the years, the yeah. number of times, but I never really tried to get a gig there myself. And so the woman was Quiva. She was oh, the, yeah, yeah. It was, it's his son. Well, she, it's, it's finished now, but she right, passed it was, away. Right, but this was back then. Yeah. It yeah. was still her. Yeah. And he kept track of the number of times he called her. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he ended up with a early, like I was five to seven or whatever. I remember what the early set was, but it was an early set. <laughs> And he kept a record, and he took a hundred and two phone calls to book that early set, and it was just like. And it's the fifty-five bar. And it was the fifty-five bar, which time. paid. I don't know. What yeah, did that yeah, pay? Yeah, Nothing yeah, practically. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, 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 it's, it's hard. It's much. It, and the, but it's that's nice the New York, you know, yeah, here so. and, and. But again, some of that stuff makes you tough. I mean, there are some. Again, I'm not. I'm not advocating for it. I'm happy to come here, and yeah. and also, I'm not willing to call anybody 102 times for a gig. Yeah, I mean, either. I've worked enough so that I. Uh, if I don't yeah. get that gig, I'll live through it. I don't know if that makes well. Some might. Some people who are have that who do have that strength, inner core strength, might make them tougher. But many people might just get discouraged, or might. Not well, that's why, and that's why, for one reason, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think New York, to some degree, is kind of a young player's game, you know. It's like those exactly that's definitely, I mean, going out all chase after somebody every night, yes. I mean, that is stuff that I used to do more when I was not not on my ass. I look, I I already pay those kind of dues, yeah. So it's that's definitely true, but yeah, so in that sense, Japan, I have. I mean, it's such a positive. Plus, the people are great. The yeah. fans are great. Yeah. Um, venues are usually always pristine, and they take care of Unbelievable. I mean, the, gear. Yeah, you know, fifty-five compare, bar. They didn't have a guitar. They didn't have a piano. Yeah, and it was broken. The they Fender Rhodes. They had a Fender Rhodes that was often in bad repair. Yeah. yeah the, I, you, when uh, you know that was one of the social media. And right things. next to the toilet too. Right. Oh my goodness! That was one of the social media things when that started. Uh, when I think Facebook started, the first group I think I got into is musicians who play at Fifty Five Bar, and you would just go into that group and it would be just like post after post. How's the roads? Is it playable? <laughs> you know, it's like, and then when you come to Tokyo, I've never. I don't think I've ever been in a city that has more grand pianos at clubs. I know, man. It's, it's just, just like amazing. even small 
venues that aren't doing very well, where there's no customers or anything like that, they're, where they're really kind of struggling, they still have like a nice Yamaha grand <laughs> piano there and, it, and a usually a good sound system. Yeah, and they, they all have a guitar that yeah. works. Yeah. I it's, mean, it's really incredible. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. I thought, I, so I used to think that the piano part was a remnant of the bubble years a little bit. But I guess, I guess that's not true because it's so long. I mean, Japan's been in kind of a doldrum thing for a while. Oh, for a while. The 90s, I heard Japan was, you know, jumping with the bubbles. and. The, I think more in the 80s. Because I started coming here in the 90s. And, uh, oh, and people were saying it was... It it oh, you should have been like... Maybe, you should have been here. Well, I mean, the, when I first started coming to Japan, that was in the nine, mid-90s. And it was pretty amazing. Yeah, but, there was uh, definitely... But then it kind of, money. right around there, Pete went, you know, like any, any bubble, like, right, like, like, what, like a cryptocurrency <laughs> just yep. blows up. But anyway, so we have David Berkman here. Um, you're going to be going back to New York soon? I just, wanted to, <laughs> just wanted to do that to yeah. acknowledge I do have a face. Uh, yeah, I'm going back to New York uh, the day after tomorrow. Okay, mm-hmm. and for... Uh, Musicians, venues, people that want to uh, contact you for gigs. Sure, have please. Have come clean their house, whatever. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, anything, anything. Where, where's the best also, place Also, everything to... is for sale. I have <laughs> shoes that are, no. Um, where's the best place? Yeah, BerkmanDavid at gmail.com or DavidBerkman.com. So your website. Uh, your, your website is DavidBerkman.com. Yeah. Right. As, as you spell it, just as it sounds. Yeah, David No Berkman. hyphen, no. Nothing. David Berkman, one yeah. word. Exactly. Dot so, com. You're also on Facebook and Facebook. Uh, SNS. Yeah, you can reach uh, me through any of those. And um, any yeah. new records coming up? Any new records that just been released? Um, I'm gonna do one pretty soon. But okay. uh, I have the my last one was a solo record. It was David Berkman plays music by John Coltrane and Pete Seeger. Whoa, Pete <laughs> Seeger. I didn't know you were into the the, the P, Coltrane and Pete Seeger. In the yeah, same. it was the perfect. Uh, it, I you know it's no, everybody, everybody gets so tired of, of that combination. You know, <laughs> not another Coltrane Pete the Seeger. Pete Seeger oh my god, it's so yeah. But actually, it's funny because I always wanted to make a solo record of Coltrane tunes because I thought that would be kind of less typical for a piano player to yeah, play yeah. a little bit. And then there was a period where I was playing, I was, I got interested in solo piano and counterpoint, and I was using a lot of these kind of older tunes, kind of, um, things like We Shall Overcome and Where the yeah. Flowers, Where Have All the Flowers Gone. And I, that was music I listened to a lot when I was a kid. The first record I ever bought was actually Pete Seeger's Greatest Hits. Oh. So, you know, my font, again, it sort of comes out of the lefty kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of political stuff. But my father was really into that. And I, um, uh, anyway, so uh, I was I never had quite enough material for each one, and then uh, Matt I was pl- uh, playing with drummer Matt Wilson, and he's a pretty funny guy, and he said, you know, you should do the music of Coltrane and P- Pete Seeger because it's probably never been done. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was funny because when I actually recorded it, there's a lot of similarities in huh. certain ways because you know a lot of that music is kind of him him. Like, first of all, there's a lot of social kind of issues right, right? Okay. and then a lot of it is also kind of simple and and him oriented obviously like lyrical, lyrical yeah hymns. like those things well, like train 60s have a right similar, yeah yeah so things like alabama yeah, and those yeah, kind yeah. of and like dear lord and things like that have that kind of sound yeah, a little yeah. bit but yeah anyway so it sort of became like this 60s kind of tribute record right and so uh, if, if people want to pick up this new record you should get that yes uh, band camp on Bandcamp. On Bandcamp. David uh, Berkman plays. Can they also go to davidberkman.com? Yes, they can. And if you uh, have any trouble, please contact me and I will help great, you. Great. That's been So, yeah, long. man, everybody pick up this uh, Coltrane, Pete Seeger duo. Yes, <laughs> duo. Duo. <laughs> right, right. Performed by. They're David actually Berkman. both Pete Seeger and John Coltrane are actually on the record. Oh, that's, the, that's the main song. You've been able to bring. bring yes, okay. yes, through the miracle of, of uh, uh, reanimation and. No. DNA and DNA, uh, yes. Anyway, we all right, guys. With the great David Berkman. Thank you, Gene. It was just fun. In, in Takada no Baba. Takada no Baba Studio. Tokyo. <laughs> uh, check his check his music out. Um, we've been I've been fortunate to play with him a few times over the many years. Yeah, back in, in the back in the day we used to play right. for a while. So great. Peace. Episode ten.